a conversation with our lovely friend, Mr. Ray. Mr. Ray. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Sevika Ray. I am a journalist and editor. Currently, I'm the editor of Crofts, which is the magazine published by the UK Crofts Council. Um, I don't come in for a while, I think, and, and I, haven't, I feel like I haven't really delved into his work properly, yeah. even though we work in the same world. So I think this is kind of as much an opportunity for me to learn a bit about your work as everyone else. So I'm going to be selfish about it. <laughs> <laughs> ask everything I want to ask. Um, and I also have one of your rugs from Floor Story, which is, um, which is a nice kind of circular story to this. Uh, I'm sure all of you know a little bit about some of them that you're here, but I think I will read a little intro about you out anyway. Um, Kangan is a textile designer specialising in print and pattern. She was born in India and has been based in London since don't know this, 2005. 2005. Uh, her work explores bold colour, geometry, abstraction and playful pattern application and she has a specific interest in a variety of colour languages and processes. Her signature, signature style takes assimilated shapes and unexpected juxtapositions, which she brings to life through screen printing, weave, digital applications, large-scale installations, and a range of other mediums. She's collaborated on projects with the likes of the Tate, Ikea, Heels, and of course, Floor Story, across a range of products, including soft furnishings, rugs, and acoustic panels, and more. I don't know if there's anything to add to that, but I'm sure we'll, <laughs> we will discuss as we go. So um, I think since we're here and the launch of a couple of new collections, um, let's start by talking about those. So there's Cosmic Check and Falling Shadows. So could you tell us a bit about how you came about and what they are? Sure, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, so we're launching two, two new collections, um, Cosmic Check and Falling Shadows. Um, I'll talk about Cosmic Check first. Um, and it really started with um, a preoccupation I had with the checkerboard pattern, which started maybe five years ago, this obsession with the checkerboard pattern. And there was a reason for that as well. There were about three different um, incidents, I suppose, or things that happened that, that all culminated in this obsession for the checkerboard. And the first was uh, a brilliant project that I was doing with the date, with Tyrone, uh, where I was looking at the facade of the Switch House building, which is the extension to the date, uh, which has a very specific brick facade uh, in a checkerboard pattern. And it, it sort of started with that, and that obsession sort of continued, um, where we're sort of playing with this idea of distorting the checkerboard um, and, and, and placing it um, in various different iterations. Uh, the second thing that happened was I, I visited um, a show at the Camden Art Center called The Botanical Mind. Um, and I came across these, um, what are called yantras, which are, um, which are paintings on cloth or, um, or, or paper um, in Indian cosmic art, in sort of tantric art, in cosmic art, in ritual art. Um, and they're essentially, what they are, are a tool to, um, um, they're, they're like a diagram. So they're, they're very, very geometrically um, inclined and they're all uh, representing sort of Indian iconography but it was very very graphic and it was the visual that I was really drawn to so it was this was like my second checkerboard uh, inspiration coming in and lastly I was in Japan doing um, a project with Kyoto Design Lab where we were looking at um, <coughs> cinnamon fabric which is um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a silk crepe, crepe fabric, which actually is just hanging up there um, on the left-hand side in the, in the sort of framed um, picture there. And it's uh, traditionally used for kimonos. And what we were doing was we were coming up with alternative scenarios for how to use this fabric, because it's a dying industry, because not many people are wearing kimonos anymore. Um, but what, what happened there was I was introduced to this, uh, this incredible archive um, of the Chiriman fabric, so 300 years of Chiriman fabric and all the patterns within that. Um, and what's incredible is these, these patterns, which are 200, 300 years old, are, are very, very modern. And you know there was this sort of continuous checker board pattern that was coming up time and again. So it was all these three very disparate things that came together. Um, and it was the start of me ex exploring this sort of idea of the check. Uh, and then distorting it and, and playing with it. Um, and that formed the genesis of the Cosmic Check Collection. Uh, Falling Shadows was very much a response to lockdown, actually. 
Um, it was, it was um, you know, us going on our daily walks and observing light. So fall, fall, falling shadows is very much about light and shadow. Uh, and it's about sort of observing light and shadow in people's windows, in, you know, through blinds, through curtains. Um, so it was a very visual, um, inf direct inspiration from that sort of shine. Um, um, so, uh, so these were the sort of two collections that I was working on essentially over the last couple of years um, with various different influences that were coming in and sort of connecting them but also merging them together to form what you can see here. Yeah, I want to go back a little bit later on and talk about how these things evolved through your project as well. But, you know, so one of the, we talked about variety of influences, but I think something that often comes up is this idea of a permanent quest to explore, understand, and recontextualize re the Indian visual vernacular. Can you talk about that as a kind of starting point or feature of your work? Yeah, if, I, I, if that's true, I don't know. It, it is, yeah. it is. I mean, the, the set, what has been central to my work has been uh, the Indian visual vernacular. You know, India has an incredibly rich visual culture. Um, in, in historically, but also in our day-to-day -day contemporary lives. So what I'm really inspired by is the culture of the everyday. So it's, it's the packaging or, you know, the, the sort of uh, the trucks and transport, the, the festivals, the vegetable market. It's, that's very much what I'm drawn to. I'm drawn to the culture of the everyday, everything that you see. And I've been building up this sort of archive of images, this image bank that I've, I've had for 20 years. Uh, of everything that in inspires me. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, very conscious that India has a very, very rich textile history and, and that, that also endlessly inspires me for, for various reasons. But uh, with my work, I think a lot of, um, a lot of the, the starting points are the, the sort of visual, visual um, culture that, that, that you see, but also um, the process of printmaking um, and, and the making. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those decisions happen on the print tables. Yeah. What's the bit about kind of recontextualizing the Indian vernacular? So this is obviously not, um, you know, it's not a direct kind of translation, it's an yeah, abstraction. How, it is an abstraction. I think, so the recontextualizing really is, um, when, when, you, when you think of Indian design, or Indian textile design specifically, um, you know, you, you have very specific <coughs> images that come to mind, um, whether that's a block print, or whether that's a very embell highly embellished piece of clothing. Um, and I'm very conscious that those images appear very immediately in someone's mind. Um, and I was very conscious of, of moving away from that. Um, only because my interest lies in the more graphic qualities in what I'm looking at. Mm. Um, so when I'm when I'm designing something, my starting point might be, um, you know, things that are taken from from mm. India, from Japan, from wherever. But eventually, I want to recontextualize it to a point where, if somebody else is looking at it, they find their own meaning within that. I don't necessarily want you to have to go back and look at sort of ritual art from the 14th century or whatever. I'm, I'm sort of, um, I want it to be much more universal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's recontextualizing it to a point where um, there, I'm sort of fusing these various different things that I'm looking at, um, but also keeping it open for you to interpret mm -hmm. what you want yeah. in a way. Um, so I'd love to know more about your actual creative process because mm -hmm. we have these visual references, you mm -hmm. mentioned printmaking, mm -hmm. how does it work, you know, where do you start and how do you go through this, how much of it is etching, how much of it is digital, just, just give us a kind of picture of your process. Um, so almost every time um, it starts on the print table, so it's very much with, um, it's, it's um, I, I'll create a library of patterns and images that I'll put on the screen and I'll start playing um, directly on the print table and then make those decisions, decide the design decisions on the print table. Um, during lockdown, it was very different, obviously. It, I didn't have access to the print room, uh, didn't have access to my gen normal tools that I have. Uh, so it was it was sort of going back to, to basics as much as I could, which was sort of graph paper and color pencils and, and it sort of the whole process slowed down. It was a very cathartic 
experience actually. Um, and it, it sort of, it worked really well because this, this collection has been brewing for almost five years, I would say, even though it was developed in the last two years. I mean, Simon will tell you this because I would come every couple of years and I'd be like, I have these ideas, what do you think? And he'd be like, okay, let's, let's sample it, let's do it. I'm like, no, 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 no I'm not ready. We, we need to do some more, we need to do So, So actually, some of these designs, I have sort of had several iterations of them and have, they have been developed over the last five years. Uh, very, very slowly, um, and actually that's quite nice because it's I, I, the in that time, you know, lots of other influences have come in, lots of uh, things have changed. Um, I'm slightly sad that the Czech has come out at a point where everyone thinks it's very trendy. It's, the, the Czech is a very, very classic sort of, you know, but you can't reinvent the Czech. You can just recontextualize it. Um, but I mean, in a way, it's great. But, everyone suddenly loves it. But it, it, it was a very, very slow process, um, which was, which was uh, it, it was great, because it, it sort of almost slightly went back to the first collection that I did for Simon more than 10 years ago, mm. uh, where I was quite naive about the whole process. I was a print designer, and I was designing a rug. Uh, so there was a huge disconnect in some ways, because I, I was thinking flat graphic. You know, whereas the, the material, the process was something I was, had not been introduced to. Mm. Whereas this time, I had all that extra knowledge because we've been to to see how it works, had a bit more sort of experience with it. Um, so I was really able to push those designs mm. a bit more. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask you more about that because I also had that kind of slightly naive reaction, which is ridiculous, as someone who talks about craft all the time, with making that connection between designing a pattern mm. and <coughs> translating it, which obviously is informed by how you make and how it, how something is made. So, can you give us a bit of insight into how the making process shapes the way that the, the, the yeah, I mean, a, a, a lot of it is to do with technical restrictions that happen as well. So, I'm I'm a big I was talking to. Yeah, Rook uh, a bit earlier, like I'm a big uh, fan of the kilim, you know, handwoven rugs. I, I, I just love how they feel and I, I, I think they're really um, tactile. Uh, and of course you can say that about tufted rugs or knotted rugs, but kilims for me are, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're also very accessible to everyone, just they're affordable, they're, yeah, I, I love kilims. And, but they, and they work really well for my designs because they're very, Geometric, so actually anything horizontal and vertical works beautifully, but anything with a curve suddenly sort of goes a bit crazy. Um, so a lot of a lot of those design well, can't talk design decisions uh, had to be made also according to the pattern, mm -hmm. where if something was very very complicated and could not be woven, it had to be knotted or it had to be tufted or it had to be um, you know we sort of took it into various different um, realms. Um, so it, the making is very, very important mm. because obviously that informs everything. But also color changes according to the way it's made. Mm. So we found that when we selected all the colors, um, the same color looks completely different uh, depending on the construction. Yeah. So we had to then make those sort of tweaks um, on changing it because of the thickness of what mm. you're seeing. Um, so it, it, it's a, it's a really interesting process, but yeah. it, it's, it's one that takes time, so it does, does have to happen over a period of time. Mm. Mm. You were saying also that this project, the brief, was completely open, yeah. which is in some ways amazing, but also, I guess, there's, there's no boundaries to it. How do you deal yeah. with that as a designer? How do you know where to start? We were told you can make anything, it looks like anything. Well, I don't, clearly. That's like <laughs> <a> five years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, Simon is amazing to work with because there are sort of no restrictions in a way. Uh, That's he, <laughs> you know, he the the creative um, he gives you creative freedom, which is so important uh, for a designer. It is important to have some restrictions, and I wish you'd give some restrictions on the next step. There was a meeting last week about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I think. It's sort of, because I had so much time to develop it, there, there, there comes a natural end point as well where you say, okay, this is as ready as this can be, for now. 
And then the, the great thing about these rugs are that they are sort of made to order. Each one is individual. So the next one, we can do another one. <laughs> we, can, we can keep changing it. It's endless. It's great. And you said you've got a million other rug ideas. Exactly. So the, like I was saying, the checkerboard. I mean, I have got like 100 designs that were drawn up that are still waiting in the, in the archive. So, you know, we can keep extending this, this project for a while. We need to sell this range of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is a good point to talk about the other side of, of, of kind of the development, which is not just this single project, you're doing yeah. lots of other projects, and mm. how do they feed into, how do they kind of cross um, pollination? Yeah, I mean, they, so, so the other projects are, can be quite specific. So mm. for example, I've done um, a project actually not far from here in um, Exchange House, which is the, the building just on the back of Liverpool Street Station. Um, and I've done four quite large tapestries that are hanging in the, in the reception area. Mm. So that was a very, very specific brief because the building's ready. It's sort of, you know, uh, dressing, dressing the room. So it has to sit within a certain context. Um, so you're, you're immediately, you've got a certain atmosphere, you've got sort of color references that have to work with the materials there. Um, the, the tapestry itself, because it's a different process again. Um, so I worked with uh, a mill in Belgium because they were the only ones who, were, who had a loom wide enough to, to weave them. So it comes with its own set of restrictions um, and challenges, but equally, um, you know, it, it takes the work in a very different way because it's not it's not my it's not necessarily my personal work where I'm I'm bringing my uh, my context into it. Mm -hmm. It's it's very much a design brief, um, and I'm sort of taking the space um, into account when I'm when I'm designing that. Yeah. Um, equally, I'm I'm doing a mural for Tog uh, just down the road for the office group for the black and white building, and that brief was great. Basically, design a black and white <laughs> um, And you know, for someone who really loves working with color, actually, it's really refreshing to just design in black and white, especially because I'm a screen printer. And no, I think in black and white anyway to start with. So it was a really good uh, project to do, um, where I'm designing this sort of 12 meter wall uh, just with a black and white pattern. So you're so you're thinking much more about pattern than that color. Yeah. So it's like different parts of your brain that come into action. Yeah, you said you said something about one the patterns being the intuitive oh no, the colour being intuitive and emotional and, and yeah. patterns being more logical and mathematical. But uh, yeah. how do you do them do you think about them at the same time or is you do Some sometimes. So so um, you know a design can start the starting point of a design can be quite different. So it can be a colour combination that I really want to use. Yeah. Like a colour I've come across which is a specific color on the post box of the, you know, somewhere that I found that I really want to use. So sometimes that can be very much the starting point of the um, of the design. Whereas other times it can be it can be very much pattern led. Um, so um, I've got the question. No, oh, the interior. I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so yeah. I mean, I think when I work with color, I work with it very intuitively, mm -hmm. very emotionally almost, um, where um, I, I collect color as well. So as I have got that image bank, I've got like a library of color that I always have handy, mm -hmm. that I'm sort of constantly referring to. Um, whereas with the, with the design, with the actual sort of pattern application, uh, it is, I'm a very practical, logical sort of person where I like things to be quite precise. And again, I think that's the screen printer in me that's coming out. So, um, so that's much more mathematical. It's much more mm. sort of specific, um, and that works quite well together because it's not. I think the reason why they they come together well is because they're two different. I approach them differently. If I approach color very systematically, I don't think it would mm. work as well. I think because there's a bit of ambiguity in the color selection, it works with the more specific, sort of. Precise patterns. Mm -hmm. no, I understand. The other thing you were saying earlier, which I found really interesting, is about <coughs> communicating about color. Yeah. How it's culturally specific and hard to talk about. So you yeah. were talking about the book in Japan. Yeah. Can you say something more. Yeah. You, you will explain it better. Than yeah. That. So, um, so again, when I was doing the project in Japan, I came across uh, a book called it's um, 
the Dictionary of Color Combinations by a colorist called Sanzo Wada. Um, he, he put together this book in the 30s where he formed the Institute of Color in Japan, like Japanese color. Really interesting. And um, it was interesting. It came about because he went to India um, and they were trying to communicate very specific Japanese color to some factories in India and they suggested why don't you come up with a standard like a like a Pantone or a, you know like a color, like a Japanese color standard. And he said, well that's a good idea. And he went back and he could have put all of these together and created this book. Uh, so color communication is so interesting because uh, a color could mean so many different things in different cultures, but visually but also emotionally. And I, I find that quite interesting. Um, so a lot of the color that you see here is actually also sort of responding to that book mm. and what I found there because I was sort of walking around with this dictionary in Kyoto and basically finding these color combinations in real life uh, which had been there for like 50 years but they slightly changed because they faded over time or whatever so it was it lived color is a living breathing thing as mm. well and it's sort of constantly changing yeah so I find that quite interesting yeah I mean it's interesting to think about how that works with what you're making because you may have a very specific emotional mm. response to colour, but you have no idea what someone who's no. going to live with your rug has. It. Exactly. Is, is that exciting? Does it bother you? You're like, this is supposed to be an angry rug or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think it's, I, I, think it's, I think it's quite exciting if someone chooses a, a rug in a colour that they wouldn't necessarily choose, use themselves. Mm. Uh, because colour can be quite surprising yeah. and it can have a very immediate sort of effect. Mm. Uh, on people, sort of yeah. emotionally. Um, so I, I think, uh, I, I, I guess rugs do have their personalities. Yeah. Like you have an angry rug and a slightly. Yeah, I'd probably angry, angry rug, rug is an exaggeration. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's happy rug. You know, you have your happy yeah. rugs and you have your slightly more serious rugs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for both of them. No rugs fight. Um, it would be quite nice to. Have been have a way to sort of for those personalities to change and, and yeah. Um, so the other side of your work is teaching. Yeah. So um, how does that fit with what you do in your own personal creative? Um, I think the teaching keeps me on my toes. It sort of forces me to confront things. Um, you know. Like the world, the world has changed in the last ten, what in, in the last twenty years? But how the, the the design world, how we talk about material and how we talk about consumption and how we talk about mm. making as well. Um, and like I was saying to you earlier, the the course I teach on is the course I studied on as a student, it's a and it's a completely yeah. different course now. Um, and it's really exciting because actually, you know, we are what is the sort of designer we want to be? Yeah. Who, who is the sort of designer we want to, what is the sort of designs we want to make? Um, and a lot of the conversations we have at college with students, with my peers, with you know the amazing community at St. St. Martin's, it filters through all the conversations that we have with design studios, with, yeah. with companies that I'm working with. So it's, it's sort of, it's, they go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think they're, e they're equally sort of important because you can't be making in isolation. They have to, mm. yeah. we have to be so conscious about what we're making. And do you think that do you feel that the industry like things is also changing in response to the yes. development that you said was like definitely yeah. definitely yeah. in in there's sort of small steps because you know these the systems are so embedded. Um, that will take a really long time, but, but the conversations are happening, and that's that's the mm. main thing. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of finally, since we have half an hour to wrap up, is um, can you tell us a bit about what you're doing next? What are we doing Insights next? Insights into the next few projects. Next few projects. Uh, well, uh, we're la launching the tapestries very mm -hmm. soon. So I've, I've talked about them, but they have, I haven't actually put them out there in the world. So that's sort of happening quite soon. Um, working uh, with um, 
stationery. We're doing doing a range of stationery with um, um, with a really lovely company in based in London. Um, working with Andrea on a really lovely project as well. Um, which is which is which is which is super secretive right now. <laughs> when we're working together, okay. something exciting that's coming. Uh, yeah, there's there's lots of things that are happening that I can't sort of exactly talk about. Uh, but but we'll talk. There, there's 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 lots of there's lots more uh, product, but um, new sort of you know new new product in different scales. Mm. Um, yes, not necessarily textiles. Ooh, okay, yeah, right, <laughs> which is exciting. Very exciting. We might not get anything more out of you, so maybe that is a good place to stop. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.